Morning, everyone from, from sunny California. Hello, my name is Shirley Severe Talon, and I am the application support associate for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherokee Health System for hosting today's session, Pediatric Acne with Dr. Susan Boyko. Dr. Boyko is a clinical associate professor of pediatric and dermatology at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. As a pediatrician in the Air Force, Dr. Boyko became interested in the rashes, moles, and birthmarks she observed on her patients. After completing a dermatology residency, she joined the faculty as a pediatric dermatologist at the University of Cincinnati. They spent most then spent most of her career as a general dermatologist at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, where she also served as a volunteer professor of pediatric dermatology at UCSD. She's an active volunteer here and abroad, and we are so very lucky to have her as a Maven Project volunteer. When you're ready, please begin, Dr. Boyka. Oh, thank you so much. And as I was saying, welcome. Uh, to sunny California, I'm looking out my window and watching the palm trees waving gently in the breeze as we have our breakout session. And it's called a breakout session because that's why your patients are coming to see you. So we, we tried this earlier and, oh, I see, I'm on the wrong view. Let me go to the correct one. There we go. All right. So I have nothing to disclose in this presentation. And today, I hope that at the end of this uh, discussion, you'll be able to look at acne on your patients and make a grade of it based on the type of acne you see, how severe it is, and where it's located on the person. To be able to assess the psychological impact regardless of the, of the grade of the acne or its appearance to you, and to finally recommend treatment for the greatest adherence and success for your patient and gratification for yourself to see improvement. So usually what I do when I walk into a room, I introduce everyone in the room. I'm usually introducing myself for the first time. I'm going over to the sink and usually I'm telling the kids, uh, what's the very first thing you want the doctor to do before they touch you? And that is wash your hands. And then I say, my name is, and I give my pronouns, and, and what are, what's your name? And why did you come to see me today? How can I help you with your skin? And one of the most important things you can do is seize the device. If you often walk in and the child or the parents have their phone in their hand, so you can uh, politely ask the parent to kind of turn the phone over or turn it off. You can take the phone from the patient and say, we're going to be using this together to help you improve your skin. And that always intrigues them because most of the time the doctor's talking to the parent and the kid is sitting there playing with their phone completely divorced from the conversation. So the minute you can take the hold of that phone, in the olden days, we would say, take hold of the list. But people no longer, except for people of my vintage, carry these pieces of paper anymore. We've all got our phones instead. So the first thing that you need to consider when you're talking to a patient and their family is what do you need to know in the patient's history? And often when I do this as a more interactive program, I ask you to tell me those things. But I see that um, since we're not going to be able to do that, so the, 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 usual, the usual things that you know to ask, the current and past products use, but some things you may not realize are important to ask is, do they have acne or breakouts in their armpits or their groin to think about associated conditions such as hydradenitis separativa? Is there a family history of acne? That's very important because often you'll see, if you just look at the parent, you'll see terrible acne scarring and really you know that that could be a prediction for the patient's future and you want to avoid that. So you want to be aggressive as you'll hear. 
Um, are there any supplements, any hormones, any oral or implanted contraceptives that the patient may have? And sometimes uh, you may not find this out on the first visit. They may not trust you or uh, some young boys um, will be told by their coaches to take supplements. And some of those supplements may contain uh, anabolic steroids, which may aggravate acne. What's their general health with changes in weight, height, any other medicines they're taking, any sports or their activities? Uh, are they outdoors? Because when you're outdoors, some of the medicines we give for acne, sunlight may aggravate uh, side effects from them. What, what's their gender identity? If their chromosomes are XX, uh, when was their period? Uh, when did their period start? Uh, what are their periods like now? Uh, a red flag for acne and young women is that their periods, um, if they're irregular after one year, that you want to take that into consideration too. What's their tanner stage? Is it possible that the person can get pregnant? And um, for uh, boys also consider their tanner stage. And then how do you assess the patient's mood with and without parents? Well, in the olden days, you just walk in and maybe the kid would look a little grouchy. They didn't want to be in the doctor's office. The parent, they just finished a little shouting match before you came in. But um, I always ask, how does your acne make you feel? This was a patient that I saw in the 1980s. And she was the happiest, most cheerful teenager uh, she just stayed in my memory because she had this awful scarring acne and she was just enjoying life so much. She didn't let anything hold her back. And certainly as we could clear up her acne, she was even uh, more um, happy. But my colleague, Dr. Larry Eichenfield, uh, who is a wonderful pediatric dermatologist, said that clinical severity of acne may not always be a good predictor of the psychological impact. In other words, you could have somebody who has terrible acne and they're sailing through life or somebody who has one pimple and spends hours in front of the mirror, unable to draw their gaze away to enjoy life. So are there psychological scores that you can have with acne? Certainly. So you want to ask about how they're doing socially and academically. I can remember one young man with severe acne and he would not look me in the eye. And as his acne improved, he was dating, he was um, more social. Um, so very important to assess their mood and quality of life. And then use magnification and lighting. But one, one thing that uh, we always seem to forget is to take off the clothes. And you know, um, there's so many TV shows now, and even if you see your own doctor, they'll be listening to your heart and lungs through your clothing. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, I would strongly advocate for you asking for a gown, even for a waist up exam, and let them actually look at the places that are harder for you to look at. So in your own office, use magnification and lighting. I used to use those old dorky glasses that fold over, and uh, I now use other magnifying devices. If you are doing teledermatology or electronic medical record, you want the facial side view with the hair pulled back. You want to look at the trunk and arms. Um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to look at armpits, side light, because you know that if you look at yourself in the mirror or you look at yourself on a Zoom, your skin looks great. And then when you side light, you can see all the little pits and indentations and scars that you may not be able to see. And even take a picture of the patient's back and show it to them. They may not be able to see it in the mirror or they may not be looking at it. So to talk to you about what just happened here. Oh, sorry about that. Um, this is the American Academy of Dermatology has a program called Good Skin Knowledge. And one thing that's very important uh, for children to learn, there are volunteers that come to the classrooms and after school activities and teach kids. And here is the acne lesson plan. So they have even from ages eight to 10, when people are starting to get their first pimples, what is acne? And do I have acne? And feel free to go to this resource, use it with your patients, and you will learn. Um, the best way that I find to learn things is to read the information for patients first and then read the textbook. So this is one thing that I like to say that kind of livens up the 
um, exam room is that the clogged pores are your ancestors' fault. So, you know, it's like the kid, the parents will always say, doctor, tell him to wash his face. He doesn't wash his face. And I explain to them, if you take your hand like this and you have a clogged drain, if you just scrub across the top of the drain, the clog won't open. You have to kind of ream it out. So remember that your poor relations are what's causing your acne. So what makes pores clog? And, you know, everybody thinks that they have a certain diet that you should be eating. What about stress and what about picking? So here is the simple pimple recipe. So how do you make a clogged pore? You need oil and that is coming at puberty. You need bacteria that are on everyone's skin anyway. You need some dead skin cells and you need the pore and then it clogs up. So this is how I classify acne. I call mild acne, which people will call zits, papules and pustules, the actual bumps, and comedones, which are the blackheads or constipated pores. Moderate acne is the same as mild acne with nodules or lumps that are less than five millimeters in diameter. So if you have lumps that are about the size of pencil erasers, you're in the moderate category. And if you have them bigger than pencil erasers or you see scars, like sometimes I see very mild looking acne, but I pull the hair back at the temples and you look right here and you can already see some pits and some scars. And that's when it automatically goes up in the severe category because it's already scarring. So you see in this infant, there's some clogged pores, but you know that those uh, the clogging of the pores from the maternal hormones is going to go away very soon by itself. So you describe it, you document it, and the best thing is remember the picture is worth a thousand words. So if I write on my um, medical electronic medical record, there are papules, pustules, and comedones. Well, that doesn't tell me how many there are or where, you know, like on the face. But if I have a nice picture showing them, then even if I'm not seeing that patient at the follow-up, my colleague will be able to see that there is um, improvement or no improvement. So mild acne is the constipated pores. If you just turn and look at the person sitting next to you, or you even look at yourself, or you take a nice and large picture with your phone and you look at your nose, you are probably going to see these comedones. And comedone is just a fancy medical word for blackheads, which is oil that's oxidized. Like if you just take regular vegetable oil and you put it in your picture window of your living room, it's going to turn dark. And that along with the pigment cells in your skin and dead skin makes this dark color. So you see blackheads and sometimes people's blackheads are truly black if they have darker colored skin. You could have um, brown heads or even kind of blonde heads if you don't have much pigment. White heads are just the little bumps with um, dead skin trapped under them. And if you see scars, with blackheads, you go right to the severe category. So here are the zits. The zits are constipated pores that are inflamed and some of them have even been picked or scratched. You could see the little hemorrhagic crusts there. So papules are just another name for bumps and pustules are bumps with pus in them. So if you have darker skin, sometimes it's a little harder to see these uh, papules, and you can especially see the papules on the upper lip, and you can see one crusted papule on the chin, and you can look at the forehead, and there's a bunch of papules there, and that's why you need a nice bright light when you have darker skin, because the darker skin can hide redness, it can hide inflammation, and it can hide uh, increased pigment after the acne is resolving. So acne treatment is for a lifetime. I'm 70 years old and I had a zit on my nose last week. So basically acne treatment can be summarized by my colleague Gary White as saying, open the pore, kill the bacteria. 
And the other thing that we want to do when we open the pore and kill the bacteria is prevent and treat scarring. And we don't want to forget to address mental health issues as well. And always good to have somebody that you can call if somebody seems very depressed or obsessed with their appearance out of proportion to what their acne looks like. And I highly recommend this resource for the um, public and for your own education. It's the American Academy of Dermatology's page on acne, their acne resource center, DIY acne treatment. Everyone can have clearer skin. And again, we talked about seizing the phone. So there's several good things you can do with a phone to help your patient get the best possible skin. One is to help the patient set reminders of what product to use and when. That's a great thing as you're talking to the teen, like what's your schedule? Do you want to do things more in the morning or in the evening? In my household with three active children, I found that it was almost impossible to do anything in the morning other than brush teeth, get food into them, and hopefully get all the things they needed for the day in the car. So maybe you want to do things more afternoon and evening. And add educational materials to review at home in the most familiar language. We in California have many different languages, such as Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, Creole, French, and you can, if the, especially if the parents have a different language in their phone, the kid will immediately grab the phone and find it with a little help from you, find the resources for them so they can understand what you're saying. Because the worst thing in an exam is to be with parents and a child and the child understands you, your English perfectly and the parents kind of nod politely and you think they're understanding. And then as they get up to leave, they say that they don't speak English in their native language. So uh, take before and after photos, keep them in their own phone and add them also to the electronic medical record. So how do I treat blackheads and whiteheads? So again, here in the picture, you can see on the upper part of the forehead, there is mostly these whitish bumps. And these are the clog pores that have very narrow necks. So the opening is very tight. So the dead skin is building up underneath and gives it that white color. As the pore kind of opens a little more, it has more of that black color. And you can see it's the same patient because they have the same scar on their forehead. So before and after, how long does this take to get better? It's going to be at least two months. You tell them just as like their acne didn't come up over the past uh, five minutes, it's not gonna go away in five minutes. You wanna set expectations right away. You wanna say, you kind of wanna under promise and over deliver. So you say in about two months, maybe half of the spots will be gone. And, and that's usually about where you are in three months, maybe 75%. So I say two months, because they, they see these commercials where the person the next day, it looks like the pimple's gone. Um, so I usually start with a dapolene gel. You can buy this in uh, most uh, pharmacies and big box stores. 0.1%, which used to be our prescription strength is now over the counter. That's gone from $160 a tube prescription to about 10 or $15 a tube over the counter. So that's, a, that's one incidence in your entire life where your drug costs have gone down. And the 0.3% gel is by prescription. And then I like to follow up in two months and take before and after photos and then set the expectation under promise, at least a third will be gone. Topical retinoid tips. What I really like to do with topical retinoids is I like to do the one, two, three, four, five. And I have, I take their finger and I put it on their face and go one, two, three, four, five. When they come back, I ask them to show me how they do that. And if they can remember one, two, three, four, five, I have a better idea of their adherence that they're actually doing it. So you take that little dab of retinoid and then you dab it on. And then how much do you need for your back and chest? We'll think of them as faces. So you're going to need about two or four P's on your back and chest and a P on each shoulder. And you want to put it all over rather than spot treating. The reason you want to do it all over is that you're, it's like a garden with weeds. You can see the weeds and you can pull them up. That's spot treating. But if you can put down a weed killer, then you can prevent spots from coming up. 
And you want to put it on in the evening after you shower and use the benzoyl peroxide wash in the shower and rinse it off in the shower. And in the morning, if you can possibly do it, have them put the sunscreen on, even if it comes to taking those little sticks in the car and as you're driving them to school or as they're on their way to activities, they're kind of uh, putting their sunscreen on. So again, count to five, one, two, three, four, five. And then if you have mild to moderate acne where you have those papules and inflamed uh, areas, pustules, um, how do you wanna treat them? I would use the over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide wash on the face, trunks, and oftentimes um, you may not always be looking at the buttocks, but as a dermatologist, I'm trying to look at every possible area of skin. And you'll often see, especially in the boys, they get very sweaty butts and they have buttock folliculitis. And this will be a great way to take care of that too. And have them wash at least twice a week. And you could see the price is right, $367 in Walmart. And then the Dabolene gel or cream is $1347 in Walmart. And then if people don't even have the funds for this, there are prescription um, forms of benzoyl peroxide and adapalene that you can use as well. Uh, if you have the ability to do in-office dispensing, um, there was one study where they took people two weeks after the visit. Hmm. I don't know why the computer suddenly decided to annoy me like that, but okay. So again, 84 acne visits, two weeks after the visit, some people remember they were supposed to use benzoyl peroxide, uh, but most of the people did not buy the over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide. Some did get some over-the-counter product, and usually those products, it says like acne wash, and it has salicylic acid or resorcinol in it. But 99% of the people did get their acne prescription. So again, if you find that you're having trouble um, with people getting benzoyl peroxide, if the insurance will cover it, you can write for a prescription benzoyl peroxide product, but there's really, it is no difference. So again, the moderate acne is the worst zits and the constipated pores. So you're gonna have those papules and pustules, those are the zits, and then the comedons, the blackheads, and then the lumps. Now in this picture, you can see some of those pustules are larger and then just above the right side of the lip you can see kind of a lump and that's a nodule and you can sometimes you can feel these nodules even better than seeing them and you can see this is mostly around the mouth we don't have the rest of the face here and this is pretty widespread looking so this is moderate acne so for this again use the benzoyl peroxide um, use the adapalene and then here uh, is mask knee. Uh, we were, I was hoping that uh, this would be like a slide of remembering from the past, but as uh, especially as health professionals, you're wearing masks and you're getting acne from the mask too. And you could even see a little scarring on the chin of this person. So uh, the best thing you could do if you have a mask is if you have the ability to take the mask off, if you have the ability when the mask gets kind of wet under it, to take it off and put a dry mask on, all those things will be helpful. And then if you go to the very worst um, of the moderate acne, you have these terrible pustules like this, always think about gram negative folliculitis, always unroof one of these pustules and culture it. And uh, then you can see extensive pustules and some uh, crusting on the back as well. So if you have moderate or severe acne, you can use a short contact treatment that will be uh, more affordable, which is to use the generic tazeratine 0 0.5, 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 cream, and you put it on for 30 minutes and then you rinse it off every night before bedtime. And usually the chest and trunk are a little hardier and you don't need to rinse it off those areas unless you're getting irritated. But this is pregnancy category X. There is some theoretical possibility of this being absorbed. So 
if the person is at risk for pregnancy, uh, I don't recommend using this particular uh, retinoid. And then of course you'll want to give something systemic because these are large areas that need treatment and especially on that face, you need treatment fast. So what about, how do you choose between doxycycline and minocycline? First of all, whatever you choose in the cycling category, you're gonna use it for one or two months only and then refer them to a dermatologist if they're not improving. Sometimes with all that swelling on the face and pustules, you don't even realize there are scars until you see them getting better. Make sure the person always takes the medicine with a full glass of water sitting upright. My sister once uh, sw dry swallowed it and lay down and then she went to the emergency department thinking she was having a heart attack because it was adhering to her esophagus and it was incredibly painful. So if the patient can't swallow, you can crush the pills. And the usual dose of oral doxycycline is 100 milligrams twice a day, but you would want to skip the morning dose if the patient is in the sun. If they're a lifeguard, if they're taking PE, if they're at school and the school is not allowing them to apply sunscreen, uh, like if you go to school in California, my kids would always sit outside and have lunch because they didn't have a lunch room. So uh, that was not a good medicine for them to take for their acne. And it's also very affordable, even if you're paying out of pocket, a 30 day supply is less than $20. So again, to think about minocycline, um, I, my personal preference is to go with doxycycline first to, if the patient is improving, stop the doxycycline after two months and uh, continue to use your topical medicine. If they're not improving, I recommend a dermatology referral. The doxycycline, again, can photosensitize the patients. So you could give either, a, if it's a small person, maybe you have a, a, a young teen who's uh, less than uh, uh, 50 kilos, and then you give use a 50 milligram dose. If they're bigger than 50 kilos, just go for the 100 milligram dose, use it in the evening only. Um, minocycline does have rare, uh, and rare could be 1%. So if you have a lot of patients with acne, you're more likely to see allergic or hypersensitivity reactions with minocycline. So it's my second line choice. And if I was um, a primary care doctor, I would want a dermatologist to manage uh, minocycline because of the possibility of side effects. And oral minocycline is also very affordable. So for oral contraceptives for patients with two X chromosomes, you want to know what your comfort level is in recommending. And I may discuss sexual activity with the parent out of the room and most teens will say yes if I ask if I can share the discussion with the parent. One of the most uh, uh, challenging experiences I've had recently was a, a, a teenage girl who had a girlfriend and was asking me, um, in all innocence, if she could still get pregnant. So um, even though um, sex education is supposed to start in third or fourth grade, there's still a big gap between what we think they know and what they think they know. So uh, very important to um, talk, frankly, with the teen, but also to uh, ask the teen for their permission and then discuss with parents. And then you want to use the oral contraceptives for at least three cycles. They're slow on the uptake before saying they don't work. I've had too many people just give up after a month. And again, you want to take that menstrual history. At the, when was their menarche? How regular are their periods? If their periods are regular with skip cycles after a year, or there's a change in the pattern, I refer them to gynecology. And if the patient is obese and uh, has like a extra hair in places they shouldn't, like uh, mustache area, beard area, uh, mid-chest uh, area, abdomen area. Uh, you can refer them to GYN or endocrinology for evaluation. And then these particular um, contracept uh, oral contraceptives are the ones that are labeled for treating acne. And the um, generic names are nergestimate, ethyl estradiol, norethinidrone, acetate, and ethyl estradiol, and drospirinone and ethyl estradiol. And drospirinone seems to have more of a uh, predilection to blood clots. So, of course, you take your history, family history of any clotting disorders or 
um, other problems uh, before you uh, recommend these drugs. And then um, these are some new things that are available if you are practicing in a resource poor setting, some of these uh, products, it's very nice to have them, but they're not going to be covered by the skinny insurance your patients may have, or if they have no insurance, they're gonna be completely unaffordable. And I really like the idea of using minocycline as a foam because you bypass all the absorption side effects, but one 30 gram can of foam is $500. So here's the problem. Um, how can you afford to treat acne with products like this? So most of the time in my patient population, I'm not using these products. And then this is a cry for help. This is uh, a patient who has severe scarring. And this is, when I see this, it's almost like the ship has already sailed and I'm like trying to leap across the ocean to board the ship and try to improve it. So most of this acne is kind of burned out. There's still some little areas of inflammation, but our whole goal in life is to uh, prevent this kind of scarring. So that's why I wrote in, in red letters, get help. So if you have papules or bumps that should be, they could be less than five millimeters in diameter, but pustules and then nodules or cysts that are larger than a pencil eraser. And don't also forget to check in their scalp, behind their ears, in their axillae and groin for concomitant hydradenitis subvertebra. So if you have something that looks like these two pictures, please don't try to manage this on their on your own, get help. Even uh, initial therapy, what you might consider is if the, even if the dermatologist doesn't have an appointment, say, just could I please send you these pictures and just tell me what you want me to start them on before they come to see you? Because many times with these patients, I will start them on oral steroids, on prednisone, to cool down the inflammation before I would even consider isotretinoin because that may aggravate it. So just like that little cheer, be aggressive, be, be aggressive. You really want to um, mitigate the increased risk for depression and anxiety. So you want to give aggressive treatment of acne and also consider psychiatric screening or referral. So if you see a patient like where this finger is pointing to that huge nodule, don't just stick a needle in there and uh, try to get out some pus. Um, get on the phone and say like uh, to your trusted dermatology colleague, what would you suggest uh, that I start with here? Certainly, if you have nothing else and it's five o'clock on a Friday night and everybody's left for the weekend, you could certainly ask them to do warm soaks on the area. You could inject a little diluted um, triamcinolone into that area if you have that available. Um, you could consider starting them on uh, doxycycline um, and a topical retinoid for the other areas. But basically on Monday, you're going to be on the phone and be asking for help. So many people are worried about using or recommending the use of isotretinoin because of this kind of myth that uh, the medicine itself causes a suicide. So independent of acne, suicide is the leading cause of death in teenagers. So even if we never talked about acne, if we just talked about any teenager walking into your office, how important it is to be well-informed about how to deal with depression and suicide for anyone in any kind of medical practice today. Now, suicide actually may be less likely for patients on isotretinoin because finally they're seeing their skin get better after the other treatments have failed. So it's not crystal clear if the medicine itself has psychological effects. In my personal experience, the psychological effect I've seen is that a great cloud lifts from over their head as their skin gets better and better, and they start to feel more confident about themselves. 
So pediatric dermatologists in our clinics, we routinely ask about their mood and suicidal thoughts before and during their treatment. So every month we're catching up on how they're doing. So one thing that Shirley and I were talking about before um, uh, we went on the air was, um, you know, what do parents want? What are um, what do some of the kids want? And, and the thing is to really listen and be respectful to what um, families want out of acne treatment. So if an alternative therapy or complementary therapy or a, a more natural approach is wanted, you can use something like tea tree oil. The problem with tea tree oil is a contact allergen. So it's just like nickel jewelry. The more that you wear it, the more likely it is that you could develop an allergic reaction to it. Tea, if you buy, also if you buy a 5% tea tree oil, it could be 5% um, tea tree in somebody's basement mixed up with a canoe paddle. Uh, whereas the benzoyl peroxide is being made in a big factory. So you always know that's going to be 5%. So it's kind of hard to know exactly what's the best product to use. It is effective. It, it'll take about five months to get to where benzoyl peroxide would get to in two or three months, but it, you can use it. And it has the same kinds of effects as benzoyl peroxide with dryness, redness, itching, and stinging. Uh, my favorite dietary in intervention is to go with a heart healthy Mediterranean type diet. That is, you know, parents tell, ask me, well, you know, is that going to make the acne better like next week? And there's all kinds of things about eliminating dairy and not, and not eating chocolate and fingers are always being pointed like you're eating that it's going to come like out in your pores. But remember that all the oil that you eat in hamburger is broken down into little carbon and uh, oxygen uh, fragments and then reassembled. So you can't, that oil from the hamburger does not directly leak out of your pores. So for a lifetime of a healthy body, the low glycemic heart healthy diet with the, the plate here, with the fruits and vegetables taking up half the plate, the grains and protein uh, taking up the other half of the plate and some dairy, to me is the healthiest and safest uh, diet to recommend. And then how do you get people to pay attention to um, their regimen? Because as you know, it, it's easy enough to brush your teeth every day, but it's harder to establish a skincare regimen. And if you, uh, there's some kind of magic about like buying something where they have this whole thing where you have to do this, this, and this. And I find that uh, usually the um, girls are more, willing to do these many step regimens faithfully than the boys who just want something to do in the shower and then they they're done so you can um first of all if you're worried that the, the parents or the people who are buying the uh medicines are going to have trouble identifying them on the shelf you can actually put images of these products in your after visit summary and that was important when the different brand of adapalene had their own wash because we found that patients were mistakenly buying the wash instead of the actual active gel to treat their acne. And they were wondering why they weren't getting better. So remember to emphasize that you're in it for the duration and give it three months before saying it doesn't work. So if there's nothing wrong with buying these kinds of products. They are a little more expensive than buying the ingredients separately. But if you have somebody who wants to do something and they like using step one, step two, step three, that is fine. It's just gonna cost you a lot more than if you buy the things separately. And then a new development on the acne horizon that's very exciting, but it is very limited right now, but it's showing a lot of promise is actually, especially for people who cannot tolerate isotretinoin. I had once a patient who had an organ transplant at a young age. And so isotretinoin was contraindicated for them. And we actually were able to use the topical tazarotene and that was very helpful. 
But here's something else that could be very helpful is laser treatment. And what the lasers do is they actually target the oil glands and shrink them just the same way that isotretinoin shrinks oil glands. So this is something, you know, right now, if you have very wealthy parents and you can get on a plane to uh, go to the cosmetic area of Massachusetts General Hospital, then feel free to spend your money on this uh, laser treatment of acne. But I think that this is something that holds a great promise. It's really a better understanding of what is making acne start in the first place. And it, and when I was a dermatology resident in the 1980s, it was like, gosh, is it the chicken or the egg? It's like, is it the hormones? And that makes the uh, oil gland bigger or is it the oil gland getting bigger that's making the acne worse? So this is some excitement for the future and please um, keep your eyes open for opportunities in your community. Maybe somebody will be doing a study. So if you have patients who would benefit from uh, kind of out of the box thinking for their acne, the website clinicaltrials.gov is a great resource. Um, who knows if there's something in Memphis or in uh, a bigger city um, near you. So before we go to questions, I want to give you the challenge to change up your practice. So think about grabbing that phone out of their hands as you walk in and using the phone to find, uh, identify resources that will be useful to your patient after they leave the room. Be able to take and interpret that relevant acne history we talked about, especially asking some of the hard questions. Go ahead and do an acne-focused physical exam. Get that gown on. Get the bra off. Look at the buttocks. Document the kinds of acne lesions you see. Is it a papule? Is it a pustule? Is it a comedone? Do you see in this picture, we really haven't talked about it much, but I'm going to uh, end with a little discussion of what's called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So you can see that this is a, a happy patient, but you can see that especially along the um, lateral cheek, there is this darker brown pigment that may last for months or even years. And you want to prevent that by using uh, your acne medicine to prevent papules and pustules and comedones from forming uh, so that there's less inflammation afterwards. You want to uh, block that inflammation with um, ultraviolet light blockers like sunscreen so that um, this pigmentation doesn't get worse. And you want to treat preventively so the pigmentation doesn't develop. And recommend treatments your patients and families will actually use. Really get to know what their day is like so that you can uh, make the recommendations about how to fit their treatments into the day. And think outside the examination room for timely follow-up appointments. One great thing you can do for teenagers is because they always have after-school activities and it's hard for their parents to get them to the doctor is to use telemedicine. And the way that you can do telemedicine is so interesting now because you can have the parent forward really good, sharp, clear pictures of the patient. And if the patient is busy, you and the parent can have the discussion and then you can have a follow-up phone call with the patient later and um, review your instructions so that not everybody has to be there at the same time. In many uh, states, Medicare will, uh, and Medicaid will allow billing even if the patient is not present, if somebody else is discussing their care. So with that, I have these references in your handout for um, interesting uh, resources for patients the, from the American Academy of Dermatology, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and from the American Academy of Family Practice. And then wonderful handouts that you can feel free to download from the Society for Pediatric Dermatology. 
with French and Spanish translations for acne, and even a patient education video. And then if you are a medical student or you would like to learn more about dermatology, um, you can register as a medical student on this website and read the basic dermatology curriculum with atopic dermatitis, acne and rosacea in the Tuesday format. And here are my references. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Boyko. It's a wonderful presentation. We do have some questions here. I see we have Whitney Leon. I will like to unmute you. I see you have your raised hand. If you can go ahead and ask your question. Whitney, you still with us? I am. Um, I accidentally hit that button, I think. So I'm so sorry. Not a problem. Uh, let's go ahead and see. Lindy Yang, she did ask a question in the chat. Uh, she stated, I'm noticing no clindamycin with initial treatment. Do you avoid or wait to use this? Typically, I see providers prescribe benzaclean as initial treatment, though I prefer adapalene. Am I saying that right? Adapalene. Adapalene for mild. So I'll go ahead and answer this question live. I was trying to really be a minimalist and just pick one pathway. There is nothing wrong with benzamycin. Uh, benzoclin, which is benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin. That's two and one. And now there's one that's even more expensive. That's benzoyl peroxide, clindamycin, and a topical retinoid. So that hits many different categories at once. The key to using clindamycin is never to use it as a standalone because you quickly develop resistance to it. That's why you use ben benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin together. So yes, you could um, use the benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin as an initial treatment. If you feel like adapalene works better in your patients, go right for it. Again, the, the problem with benzo, benzoyl peroxide and uh, clindamycin is that um, it can be irritating sometimes. And I think the adapalene is a little less irritating. So um, use what you like that works for you. And then I see another comment here, and I'm very glad to uh, say, give a good shout out for Dr. Ann Allen. Dr. Allen is a dermatologist in your community who did her dermatology training during the pandemic at UCSD. So I only literally met her once because we were all uh, working remotely. But I, I um, see that, uh, her mother has proudly announced that uh, she is available in the community. So I'm very happy to um, say hello to Deborah Allen. Great, great. Again, if, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them into our Q&A box below for us to go over. And just a reminder that the CME survey will appear in the tab when you close out of this webinar. We really, we really appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete this. Not only does this gives you CME credit, but it also help us to plan the best sessions for you. We share the feedback anonymously with the speakers and they greatly appreciate your thoughts. So I have a question to the audience. What do you think is the greatest difficulty that you have in the office with acne patients?
So while we're waiting for people to answer that, I'm going to tell you what the most difficult thing. Oh, I see some questions lighting up here right now. Okay, follow up. St Stacy Gun Gunno says follow up, and I think follow up is very challenging because again, these are busy teenagers. It's hard to get them in the office. Once you have them in the office, it's hard to get them back. So, I find that. Uh, either a telephone call, which is sort of all right, but what I'd really like is visual evidence of how they're doing. And so now uh, every it's easy for everybody to take nice, sharp photographs. And when you do that, um, then those uh, photographs can be reviewed and, and that, that you can build that as an office visit too. So I would go with, um, having it maybe an afternoon every week or two where you just do all your acne follow-ups. And then um, I see compliance or adherence. So compliance or adherence is tough, but again, here's where you can use, you can seize the phone and use your phone. I, I usually tell parents and, and kids like, uh, you, you look at the kid and you say to the kid like, uh, if your mom tells you to put your acne medicine on, do you put it on? Usually this is a boy and he's kind of like looking like, I'm busy. You say, I'm busy, mom, I'll do it later. And then you don't do it, right? So what if your phone sends an alarm and it says, put your acne medicine on it? Do you like, you hear the alarm, you pay right attention to it, right? And then you put your acne medicine on because your phone told you. So you obey your phone, right? So that's a great way to um, get uh, to increase adherence is uh, everybody sheepishly acknowledges that the kid pays more attention to the phone and will do what the phone orders them to do more than the parents. Uh, compliance, uh, Jennifer Cup is asking about compliance and cost. So again, the cheapest regimens are using just a plain, for, for mild acne, using just a plain um, adapalene for the 10 or $12 uh, for every month and a half, probably. Um, that is going to be the, the least expensive and also the um, antibiotics are going to be inexpensive too. And everybody probably knows about good RX. If you don't know about good Rx, write down this word, G-O-O-D space Rx. And that's how you can compare prices in your local community for things that you're paying for out of pocket. Um, another Kathleen Sanford is asking the difference in goals between the patient and the parent. So I really like to talk about what everybody is looking for. So what does the uh, patient, what, what does the kid want? And usually, again, if it's, it's really hard, it's more challenging for me to motivate my male patients because somehow there's this myth that, you know, a few scars, like it's a guy, like it doesn't matter. You, you know, he doesn't have to be beautiful. Um, and what I try to emphasize to them is you have a scar for life. So we really want to prevent you from having these scars that you will carry around the rest of your life. And if the parent themselves has scars, they become many, much more motivated. One other difference that I often see in between uh, patients and parents is the parent is afraid that a treatment like isotretinoin will cause uh, the child to become suicidal or will cause some other severe side effect that they withhold it because they're afraid that they, the uh, treatment will be worse than the disease. And so that um, sometimes you really have to keep seeing them and establish that trust. And sometimes if you have this very, very big discordance in goals, especially if you see scarring, I would just refer them to a dermatologist and let them handle that part of it because, um, uh, that, that's a, a discussion that could really eat up a lot of your time. 
And then another question about uh, managing expectations. And again, having the, um, asking people to bring their tube is often very helpful because then the, you, if you think you're gonna get better, but you're not using your medicine, there's a little disconnect between what your expectation is. And then again, to talk about how we expect that about a third of your acne will be better. I think people would be really happy to have a third of them get better. And oftentimes um, I'll see people and they'll say, oh, I'm no better. And then I have the picture in the electronic medical record and I can show them, hey, look, um, you're actually a lot better than you were the last time. Or sometimes I fall flat on my face and say, you know what, you're right. You're really not making progress here. You're actually getting worse. We have to kind of change direction in our treatment. So um, thank you, Elizabeth Brown, for saying that this was an awesome talk because this is one of my favorite things to talk about. But the, the quick fix, everybody loves those little patches, those little clear patches. Sometimes I even see the medical students when we're doing volunteer work, they'll have one of those little patches on. And so those are perfectly all right to deliver a little more concentrated medicine to an area. Um, not being happy with an OTC plan and just wanting an RX, I think it's perfectly all right if it's affordable for them right away, if they want the prescription, but they have to use the prescription. So again, use your armamentarium, make your um, alarm in the phone with them in the room right there that they're gonna use the medicine. And um, the idea about things being over the counter, again, you can say, you know, imagine when this was a prescription, I remember when Adapalene was 0 0.1, was $160 a tube because I had to buy one for my kids once when we were traveling. And it, that's crazy. Now that it's you know $10 a tube, somehow the $10 means it's not as good. It's like when you go to the cosmetic counter, if you go to the 99 cent store and you buy mascara, but if you go to Bloomingdale's and you buy mascara for $40, isn't that supposed to be a lot better? But it's often made by the same company with the same ingredients to package. So once you like explain that to people, it's like, oh, okay. Or you could say, you know what? Use the money you're saving on these over-the-counter products and put it into your bank for college. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? Wonderful questions, by the way. Thank you so much. What a great audience. Thank you again, Cherokee Health, for requesting this talk. And again, thank you, Dr. Boyko, for this presentation. I'll go ahead and end recording since there aren't any more questions. Thank you again.